that's, so the that's the point. It should be part of the essential or advanced service at least, um, but which is what I thought they were going to announce that at the um, the webinar yesterday or from PSNC. But I don't think that's going to happen, and um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's such a shame that um, it's peed. I think it's 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 uh, yeah. I think uh, a lot of people are a bit frustrated with the way that's happened. And I, I'll, I'll briefly kind of touch on it because uh, the reality is, uh, you know, the times are times are a bit tricky at the moment. And I think, you know, just it, we'll, we'll probably start now because with the way things are at the moment, I'm not, you know, I think everyone's quite busy. So we'll start now, inshallah, okay, and then I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that. But yeah, listen, I'll send you a text later on, inshallah, we'll, we'll catch up. Okay. Because cool. there's a couple of things that we need to kind of sort out as well, inshallah. But uh, yeah, we'll catch up, inshallah. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I want to start off by thanking God for giving me this opportunity uh, to be here today. And I'm just going to kind of unmute everyone because otherwise uh, it gets a bit tricky. <clears throat> that should be better. Right. And if I unmute all, allow participants to unmute. No, continue. Okay. Right. Fine. I should be good at this by now. Now, before we get into this, I think it's really really important to thank pharmacists for everything that you're doing honestly uh, you know yes I have an appreciation for every single healthcare professional whether you're a doctor whether you're a nurse even you know the public the taxi drivers as 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 humans I think everybody deserves an absolute shout out and we could be here sat all day discussing this 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 case, but I think, you know, when others have closed doors for pharmacy still to be open, I think it's absolutely mind blowing for that to be happening. So hats off to pharmacists for everything that they are doing and, uh, you know, just, just stay safe. You know, just make sure you stay safe and don't do anything that is not safe and make sure that you're aware of and you're keeping in mind how things are changing. But essentially, you know, we start with the name of God, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and the aim is that uh, today's webinar is basically about how you can develop your clinical skills, especially physical examination, clinical history skills, without spending five months of studying. That's the plan. Because, you know, I have spent ages, and I, I'm sure you could probably kind of make out this book, and it's a Bates book, and it's on a, a guide to clinical history taking physical examination. And it is over a thousand pages. Now, if you actually decided to go through that book, it is gonna take you probably, probably longer than five months. And the reason it is because not only would you have to learn the skills that are in there, so it will teach you how to take a history, how to do a physical examination, but then how do you apply that knowledge? And I'll give an example of, you've got a stethoscope and you want to listen to the heart. Okay, now we know that there's various areas on the heart that you could listen to uh, that would allow you to listen to different areas of the functioning of the heart. So if, for example, if you wanted to listen to the, the closing of the AV valves, you put the stethoscope in a, in, a, in, a, in a different area. If you wanted to listen to the uh, aortic or pulmonary valve, you put it in a different area. But the difficult part is, is how do you make sense of all that? How do you know what is relevant and what isn't relevant. How do you know that, is this sound normal? Is this sound, is it normal? That is what can take a long time to learn and it can take months. And I spent probably best of a year to really going through all that anatomy, all that physiology and trying to tie it all up. But today the plan is to demonstrate to you how we can get from A to B a lot quicker than you having to spend, you know, having to spend, you know, ages doing it. So, you know, First of all, quick recap on why do you even want to bother developing your clinical skills? Like, who cares? You know, why do you want to develop your clinical skills, right? So I sat down and I thought, Fahim, why did you develop your clinical skills? And it had to be more than making money. Because you see, money is always a byproduct, is always a result of anything that you do. If you offer value, if you offer services, if you go to work, you're always going to make money, right? But why is it as people, you would prefer to do one job versus another job? Why is it our people that we're more comfortable sometimes taking a pay cut? 
why is it as people that sometimes we do things that we don't get paid for and we get more value out of it? So my point is that whenever you're going to be doing anything, there has to be more than you making money to it. Because if you don't think of it in that way, it's very difficult for you to basically get up on those days when things are, things are not going in the right direction. It's raining outside, it's snowing outside, you don't have the protective equipment. You know, individuals are not saying your name the way you should be mentioned. You feel kind of vulnerable or you feel disheartened or you feel basically alone. So for me, what it was, was really making a difference to patients and, you know, bettering, bettering lives. And that's why, that's why it is why I do what I do. It was more than making money. Obviously that's important. And I'm, I've said it many times that you need to make money. You have to, you know, become financially uh, strong because if you're financially strong, you can distribute that well. So that's, that's important, but there has to be more than that. And for me, it was actually, you know, making a difference to the lives of others and seeing them come back and saying, you know, thank you very much. Secondly, you want to in sync yourself with the vision of the NHS because the NHS is changing. Everything part of the NHS is changing. So it's really important to make sure that you in sync yourself with that vision. You may also own a business, you may not own a business, but there's an opportunity there for you if you can develop your clinical skills. You know, I've had articles written about myself or how we're, you know, we're alhamdulillah generating more than 10,000 pound a month on my mind illness clinic. That's not including my aesthetics practice. You know, I've, you know, I've recently with the will of God signed up over nine students to my Medlin mastery program. So you do have huge amounts of opportunities if you develop your clinical skills. You know, and maybe you don't enjoy what you do. I'll be honest with you, it got to the stage of getting up every single morning, going to the pharmacy, dispensing, sticking a label on a box, handing out the prescription was, was boring. I didn't really find it mentally challenging. I didn't feel satisfied. I've always felt that that particular task could be given to another individual who could be trained or even maybe some sort of, you know, robot or robotics. And also I think, you may now understand that developing your clinical skills is more important than gaining your prescribing qualification. Just look around you, speak to pharmacists or nurses who are prescribers and ask them why they're not prescribing. So they've gone on their prescribing course, they've spent six months, but they can't prescribe. So that's really, really important to really think about why you want to develop your skills. And I will be honest with you, that I have also suffered with, with these seven points and plenty more on what's stopped me from developing my clinical skills going back, you know, since 2012. You know, I became a pharmacist in 2011, did my pre reg 2012 opened up a pharmacy. And why have I not, or why did I not start my prescribing or develop my clinical skills earlier? Why did I start in 2018 or 17, 18? And there's many reasons for that. You know, how many times have we attended courses and there's been no benefit? It's really interesting because I was speaking to Sadiqo recently and, uh, and he was basically saying to me about similar thing about, you know, how we've attended so many courses and at the end the next day, nothing happens. You develop these courses, you go attend these courses, you get excited. And then the reality is the next day, nothing happens. And there's many reasons for that. One is maybe you don't have the support. You know, a lot of the students who joined the medal and mastery program is they wanted a support network. They wanted to work with like-minded people. Secondly, I've been hearing this, that there are some people out there who discourage each, who discourage that, you know, discourage others. And if anyone's doing that, they have absolutely no right to do that. No right to do that. You also might be scared. And I remember when I did my, uh, my talk on the, the pharmacy show, and someone had asked a question about litigation and, and was really trying to put fear, what I felt fear and everybody else that was there. And the reality is folks, that it's not something to be really that scared about prescribing. As long as you have a support network, you're being taught it properly and you'll have proper documentation and you're doing it the right way. Anything you do in life, there's a risk attached to it. If you drive a car, there's a risk. If you're a pharmacist, there's a risk. If you're a bus driver, there's a risk, there's a risk. But ultimately you want to make sure that you're focusing on high returns and low risk. Sometimes it's not knowing where to start. 
where do I start? Where do I, how do I develop my clinical skills? Where, how do I develop my history taking physical examination skills? Maybe, you know, like some of you individuals are in Scotland or some of you in Wales and you can't attend a three day face to face course. So you don't have that support. And sometimes finances get in the way that we just can't afford an X amount to develop our course. So there's, you know, I, I totally understand that. And why for me things were going to be different was because when I developed my clinical skills and I benefited financial, alhamdulillah, you know, with this, for me, it was really, really important to develop a business or develop a service that had strong foundations. And the vision behind what I do, what I do is extremely important. Why is it that I am prepared to wake up four o'clock in the morning and focus on my craft? Why is it I'm prepared to deliver a webinar at 7.30 every Thursday? Why is it I'm prepared to give advice whenever I can? Why is it that I'm prepared to hang myself out there on LinkedIn and put my videos on there when I'm even now getting patients involved, knowing that there's gonna be individuals who are gonna start questioning, or oh, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? How did you know this? How did you know that? Oh, it's not for the safe, you know? Because ultimately how I see it is, it doesn't matter who you are, African, Caribbean, Asian, Caucasian, you know, your beliefs, ultimately we all have a fundamental right to great healthcare. Everyone in this world, we shouldn't be panicking about lack of ventilators. We shouldn't be panicking about lack of clinicians. We shouldn't be panicking about the homeless who now are at even more risk. We shouldn't be panicking about lack of protective equipment when you're working in a pharmacy to treat these patients when your doors are open, everybody else is closed. So in order for that to happen, I had said that we need to develop clinicians who are inspired, who are motivated, who have the knowledge and who want to make a difference. And that does mean that you, you are able to get the benefits that you deserve from doing this work. Whether that's financial reward, you should be financially rewarded because if you're not making money, it is difficult to, to keep the lights on. It's difficult to distribute that wealth. It's difficult to help others. So I decided that if I'm going to develop any training program, there has to be a huge why behind it. Like Simon Sinek says, it's not about what you do. It's not about how you do it. It's why you do what you do. And that was basically my vision on why I wanted to develop my training company because I wanted to make a difference to the lives of others. It was, it was you know, period and that straightforward. So today's plan is straightforward. It's to demonstrate to, to everyone who's on here live and who's gonna be listening to it on YouTube live and LinkedIn and so forth is the opportunities that you have if you decide to upskill yourself. And I wanna use myself as a case study to show you the financial rewards and how you can benefit financially. And for you to now understand why it is mandatory to upskill and not a choice. You don't have a choice, folks, that should I develop my clinical skills, should I not? You can already see what's happening. And even those individuals who work in primary care, you need to start looking about legislation. Think about nursing associates, think about physicians associate, think about paramedics who are upskilling. You tell me if you had a physician's associate, nursing associate that could prescribe, had the clinical skills versus a pharmacist who hasn't decided to upskill himself, what would you do if you were a GP practice? Really think about that. Don't just think that because you work in a GP practice, I'm not having a go at you, Sadiqor, at all. I'm definitely not having a go at you in, in any shape or form, but just because you work in a GP practice doesn't mean that your job is safe. It absolutely doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that your job is safe just because you work in a GP practice and I'm not worried, no. Physician associates, nursing associates, paramedics, Chiropodis, everyone is working at higher levels, folks. Everyone is moving to the next level. So if you want to be making sure that you are still making difference to the lives of others, you have to develop your skills and show people that we can make a difference. I recently did a post with a gentleman who presented with a history of uh, what was a fungal infection. And on the video, and it's on LinkedIn, watch it. He goes, I didn't know you pharmacists could do this. He said, I didn't know that pharmacists could do this. The public don't know what a pharmacist can do. If the public doesn't know what a pharmacist can do, then how can you influence those people who make policy? They're part of the public. So this is really, really important. And I, and I did a separate webinar on this where we went into this in depth. So it's important for you to understand that you need to upskill your staff 
and develop your skills. I also want to explain why history taking physical examination is so, so important in reaching a history. It is not about the minor illnesses. If, minor Ill if it was that easy, then why don't you pick up, the, go onto the CKS website, learn your signs, learn your symptoms, red flags, make a diagnosis. Go for it. Minor illness is the last thing that you wanna be focusing on folks. It's how you take a history, how you do a physical examination so you can reach a diagnosis. Just learning your signs, symptoms, red flags, it's not the way forward. And if it was that easy, then since 2006, you'd have pharmacists you know, who could prescribe, why is it not happened? And I also wanna give you case study of students who joined our mastery program, also those who joined our uh, MedLearn program just that we delivered in February and the one that we delivered in November. So you can know that it's not just Fahim, there are other people out there just like yourself doing exactly that. So my journey, let's, let's briefly do this. Qualified as a pharmacist in 2012, set up a pharmacy business, 100 hours working day and night, working hard. And I remember for me, you know, I never saw daylight in those three, four, three, four years. It ended up, I landed up in a divorce because I couldn't balance my family life with my work life and everything went upside down. We had funding cuts. It literally felt like the, like the NHS had literally just pulled the rug underneath my feet and just took that, that ground away from me. And we had one paymaster. If, you've, if my customers are only three people, then you pull the shots. If your biggest customer is the NHS, then the NHS decides what happens. If the NHS says there's gonna be funding cuts to pharmacy, mate, there's gonna be funding cuts to pharmacy. If the NHS says that you have to develop your clinical skills, mate, you need to develop your clinical skills because that's what your, that's what your, that is what your customer wants. Your customer is the NHS not that individual patient who presents to your pharmacy. Yes, they're customers, but think about the bigger picture. So everything went upside down at that time. It was, it was tricky. I then decided to, I said, look, you know, I'm gonna do research. And it was obvious that it, there was time to develop my clinical skills with shortage of doctors, shortage of nurses. You know, we're seeing it now. We're seeing it now live, that you can't get hold of a doctor. You can't get hold of nurses. There's no appointments. And I have helped hundreds of patients in the last two weeks hundreds of patients the last two weeks because they can't see a doctor. I also was a bit foolish because I just spent like two years, I spent like 2016 till eight till 17, 18, just spending time to get into one university. I can't even remember, oh, sorry, that's, that's not supposed to happen. Oh. oh, right, that wasn't supposed to happen. Let's redo this, right, I think you can see that. And I think that's just appeared weird. Okay, so uh, apologies for that. Right, so uh, I lost my trailer. Right, yeah, where was I? Uh, university. And I spent two years just trying to get into one particular university because it had a name, it had a rep. Two years. It doesn't matter which university you go to to get your IP qualification. Ultimately, you just need that piece of paper. No one is gonna ask the pharmacist, oh, where did you get your IP qualification from? You're a pharmacist, you have a master's level degree. When was the last time you searched for a job and somebody asked, oh, did you go to Kings or did you go to, I don't know, Liverpool or did you go to Leicester? Nobody cares. So after the troubles and everything I went through, I eventually did develop my clinical skills. But the reality was I lacked confidence because the non-medical prescribing is, was never ever meant to teach you clinical skills. You were supposed to have your clinical skills and then you gained this qualification that allowed you to legally prescribe. Because if we go back and look at policy, when nurses were given this opportunity, the reason they were given this opportunity to prescribe was because they were already making diagnosis. They were already had an understanding of the various sciences of the human body. And the, and the issue was that they would call up the doctor and say, you know, Dr. Darshan or Dr. Sadiqo, Dr. Farah, or Dr. Tazin, I've got this patient here, he has otitis media, could you write a prescription? And the doctor would prescribe. But the problem you had was when something goes wrong, who's responsible for the care? Who's liable? If I'm the doctor and I'm writing the script, but the nurse is making the diagnosis, there was an issue with medical legal care. Who's responsible? That's why they developed the prescribing program that go on this six months, show us that you're capable, get your skills. But the loophole is that even if you don't have the clinical skills, you can self-fund. 
And so what happened was a lot of pharmacists started and, and nurses started to sell fun and nothing happened. And they couldn't develop their clinical skills and they got stuck. And I did exactly the same thing. I did exactly the same thing and I fell for that trap. Knowing that why would, why would it take since 2006 to develop your clinical skills? Why has no one done it? But I thought, you know what? Probably because there was a need for it. And when I qualified, I saw my first patient, everything fell apart. Then I had a financial issue. We were so close to bankruptcy because I spent all that time on, on, on my clinical, on my uh, prescribing. We took on locums. Stress was building up. I thought, oh my Lord, what have I put myself into now? I remember my brother sat there saying, we've messed it up. You know, we had taken on staff with the hope that once you get your prescribing qualification, your plans are going to be set. It didn't happen. So then I thought, let me do my aesthetics. I then spent even more money on a, on a level seven program on my aesthetics. And I ended up spending 15,000, 20,000 pounds of that. Uh, oh, nightmare. But I did spend that much money. And that eventually after then doing human dissection, I got comfortable at it and started getting mentoring with doctor, with the doctors that I, you know, I started to kind of recuperate the money that I had lost. But the trouble with aesthetics is, is there's so much competition. Nurses, doctors, cardiologists, beauticians, dermatologists, they're all doing aesthetics. So I always thought that even though my aesthetic business is doing well, what stops me from, from being different to them? Or what makes me rather more different to them? Why would Farah or Sadiqur or Fahim go to my cl clinic versus this? And there's not much there. You've got, you're dealing with doctors, you're dealing with nurses. So that, that it's, it's tricky. So I started to develop a lot of content, a lot of videos to get out there. And that, that helped a lot. But I realized that the key's got to be minor illnesses because that's the gap. That's the gap in the market because the truth is no one's doing this. They're all in primary care, but in community, if you could do this mind blowing. So then I set up my practice. I did a lot of learning, as you probably know, started spending time with doctors, started getting mentoring. I started reading my anatomy, physiology. I spent two years on just studying, on developing my craft, to working every day in the morning, getting up at four o'clock till six o'clock, I would study. Six till seven, I would then go to work. Seven till nine, I would then, seven till eight, seven till six, sorry, I would work in Bista, I'd come back, have, have a break, and then study again get up in the morning, did that for two years. Then I had an article in the chemist and druggist written about me. I won an award, I won the pharmacist of the year last year. You know, this year, Alhamdulillah, I've been invited to work with the NHS, Health Education England, been invited to, you know, various STPs. I was invited to start to speak at the pharmacy show, again, you know, being paid for, for you know, and it's got to the stage now where I'm actually not paying to do what I do. People pay me to talk. My clinic is generating around 12,000 pound a month on my prescribing. Uh, my mastery program, as you know, in the first, in my first cohort, we've signed up 10 students and it's at 14, 13, nine and five. So you can do the maths. But I thought, you know what? I don't really want Farah or Sadiqur or, or anyone or Darshan or, or anyone to spend two years on this. It takes too long. You can't be spending two years on this that's going to take too long. There's got to be a faster way because two years is, is too much. Time is money, right? So if you have to spend two years doing this, it's going to take too long and you could be, you lose out on that earning capacity. So I then thought, let me develop a course that is viable for everyone and it gets you on that ladder. And that's what we're discussing today, the history taking physical examination course because that's the first step in order to reach, to reach your aims of developing clinical skills. Like I said, look at the figures. 39 and five, 10 students, 12 and a half thousand a month of my prescribing. I'm not even gonna talk about my aesthetics business because that's Alhamdulillah, that's, that's at a different level. But developing your skills, you have the opportunities and you don't have to own a pharmacy. You don't have to own a pharmacy. And we're gonna be demonstrating that this year with three or four students on the medical and mastery program with their own pharmacies, who have set up their own clinics. Mindset, mindset is so important because 
The reason why a lot of pharmacists struggle with clinical skills is because they think that minor illnesses and minor illness training is more important than history taking. Pharmacists seem to have this, this mental block, like an AV block or an essay node block that just says, minor illnesses, teach me minor illnesses. Folks, if it was that straightforward, why don't you pick up a book on a CKS, clinical knowledge summaries, and read the minor illnesses? You don't need to pay 2,000 pounds or attend a course for that. And if it was that straightforward, there are already courses that teach you minor illnesses. Go do a five-day course. Go do a three-day course. You won't be doing anything with it because you're not understanding how the human body works. You're not understanding that this piece of kit is so, so, so complex. It's not that straightforward that I can just start treating because I know a couple of signs and symptoms. And I'll, I'll show you today. I had a particular individual who is in charge of a big chain of pharmacies. So, excuse me. I don't want to start coughing because if I cough, you might start thinking something else and that is not the case. But this particular individual had over 30, 40 pharmacies. He got in touch with me and he said, look, you know, I want to learn to prescribe. I've got around 40, 50 pharmacists. We want to bring them on your course. How can we do that? And I gave him a structure. And he said, no, no, it's the minor illnesses that we want. And I said, listen, listen, miss, it's, if it was that straightforward, every Tom, Dick and Harry would be doing it. It's not that easy. No, 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 no. History taking physical examination is important to minor illnesses. Two years, two years, and none of their pharmacists are prescribing. Sat there. Two, they've actually closed two of their pharmacies as well. Funding cuts because they didn't listen. You're not, they're not listening. They have this mental block that minor illnesses is all I need to learn. If I learn my signs, I learn my symptoms, I learn my differentials, it's easy to prescribe. It ain't that straightforward. There's a structure to this and there's a way to do this. Let's look at this. Look at these cases here. And Liana, you are on the MedLearn Mastery Program, and I think there might be another student here. This is going to be important for you because it's going to help you with your case today. It's going to help you with your case. So we have a patient here. This patient here presented to me with unilateral facial swelling. So the right-hand side of her face was swollen. It literally started on the, I saw her on the, on the Monday, it started on the Sunday. She presented to me on the Monday in the pharmacy. And she was tender around the parotid duct or the parotid gland. Her lymph nodes were tender. She had a temperature of 39 degrees. She had a pulse of 106. How do you make a diagnosis? This particular patient here has a, uh, what we would describe it as a papular pustular rash and you can see the erythema and the redness that's on this base and how do you make a diagnosis it's been there for nearly two years it comes and goes how do you make the diagnosis it could be acne it could be it could be you know some people get various fungal infections it could be rosacea there's a whole list of things it could be this particular case could be Cellular, facial uh, orbital cellulitis, can be facial cellulitis, could be trauma, could be bacteria uh, parotitis, when you end up getting the, you know, the, the glands of the, the salivary gland become infected, could be an abscess, you know, it could be possibly even development of, uh, you know, some sort of cancer, it could be anything. How do you make that diagnosis? You can learn your signs and symptoms, you can memorize all the signs and symptoms in the book, it's not that straightforward to make a diagnosis. Have a look at this case. Have a look at this case on the left hand side. This lady, this lady presented with a rash. You can see that it was a painful rash. It was on a erythematous base and painful. Could be shingles. It could be, could be some sort of allergy, it could be trauma, it could be anything. Have a look at this on the right hand side. Tonsillitis, could be quincy, could be infectious monoclonosis could be a herpes infection. How do you make that diagnosis? And these are cases that I'm seeing folks all the time, every time I'm seeing these cases coming through in the pharmacy. 
And just by knowing your signs and symptoms, isn't that straightforward? I could actually, I could actually give you the signs and symptoms and I could say, these are the signs, symptoms, make a diagnosis. Not that straightforward. It is absolutely not that straightforward. So there's, there's, more, there's more to it. There's a lot more to it. So have a look at this case. That is the, what we call the external acoustic meatus or the outer ear canal. Have a look at that. Look how inflamed that is. How do you make that diagnosis? So there's the list of everything it could be. And that's just literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. 10. And there's probably a lot more to it. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a chance to, to have a to have a think about this case. And you know, pharmacists, uh, Liana, you're, you're on the, the mastery program and there might be a, another one of the students on the program. Uh, it is, whenever you are trying to reach a diagnosis, it's really important for you to know the history. It's really important for, yes, for you to understand the conditions, but it's even more important that how do you rule out mumps? How do you rule out bacteria parotitis? How do you rule out mumps? How do you rule out cellulitis? How do you rule out a dental abscess? How do I make that diagnosis? Temperature of 39, 14 year old girl, pulse of 106. She is unwell. Have a look at the structure. Now, Liana, because you're on the Medland Mastery Program, take a picture of this. Whenever that you take a history or you do a physical examination, it's really, really important for you to know the structure. It's really important for you to understand firstly, is this patient acutely unwell? Is this patient looking toxic? Is this patient looking septic? And let me tell you something that patients may present looking well, can develop toxicity or can go into shock very fast as well. It's not that straightforward. You might see them at that time and their pulse, their temperature, their vitals might be normal and bang, half an hour, one hour, all deteriorates, everything changes. You observe the patient as they walk in. Obviously in emergency medicine, you're looking at airways, breathing, circulation and so forth. You introduce yourself. You remember, this is the most important thing that you are comparing stories. When I'm dealing with this case, I'm thinking, okay, I've got this patient, a 14 year old girl who presents with facial swelling. First of all, let me think of all the differentials that come to my mind. Forget even the history. What are the differentials that come to my mind? What could this possibly be? What could this possibly be? So I think of all the list of conditions that come to my mind, and then I start to whittle out, or I start to what we call diagnosis by exclusion, what it can and can't be. Mumps, for example, I'm just gonna give you an example, mumps. So what's gonna be important about mumps? Vaccination history. Secondly, mumps normally presents bilaterally. It's not normally unilateral. Dental abscess, there must be some sort of dental pain that must be there. There must be some sort of dental kind of morphology or some sort of dental issue that might present that would make me think for that you need to inspect the oral cavity. Trauma, salivary gland stones, really important. We've got the parotid gland, submandibular gland, submental gland. These are all glands that are releasing various so, 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 you know, releasing various chemicals such as saliva that help with the digestion process and so forth. Cellu cellulitis, herpes zoster. Herpes zoster, let me show you something like this. You look at herpes zoster, right? Have a look at this. Have a look at herpes zoster. What's important to remember in life all the time is with herpes infections normally it presents on a red base. Have a look at the skin here and compare that to the skin there. I hope it makes sense. It's on a, what we say it's on a red base. It's on a, it is on a red base. 
Can you see? Can you see how it's on a red base? It, look at the rest of the skin. Have a look at that part of the skin there. Look at that. It's all red. But on the outside, it's not red. That's how you, you can easily diagnose somebody with some sort of herpes infection because it presents as clusters. It's only erythematous base. It also doesn't cross the midline because it works on, on, on dermatomes. Dermatomes are literally parts of the skin that are supplied by individual nerve endings, individual nerve supply that part of the skin. So if her back was halved here, this rash would never cross that side. So it would, if I look at this picture here, it's never gonna go, it's never gonna cross. You could get a rash here, but you're not ever gonna get a rash that goes all the way across. You're never gonna get a rash that goes all the way across. So, you know, just like myself, if I was to get herpes, God forbid, it's never gonna go across my chest. I could get lesions here and I could get lesions here, but never crosses the midline. This particular case was an interesting one because this could have actually been a Quincy. It wasn't, but it looks very much like it. Look at that, look at those exudate. Have a look at the, you know, the, 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 the discharge that's happening there. Again, herpes, herp, not herpes, history taking, history taking, physical examination. Because infectious monoclonosis that can also present with similar symptoms, you don't normally get overall tenderness here. Keep that in mind. In addition to that, with infectious monoclonosis, the age range. This was a 20, 29, uh, 20, 27 year old uh, patient. It was actually my wife, to be honest. I'm, I, think, I think that's how old she is. I don't know. I better be careful what I say, but she's, I think that's how old she is. But definitely she didn't have Quincy. But look, how do you make that diagnosis? So this, this gentleman, have a look at that. That is the outer canal. Look at that discharge. In actual fact, I treated him and now I had to refer him to hospital because he needs a wick. If you don't know what a wick is, it's this, it's this piece of... Uh, this special kind of medicinal device that you put inside the ear and then you put the drops and it does, and it will, it will expand and that, that you know, the, the drops are able to come in contact with the actual, the, the epithelial lining because giving this sort of person antibiotics is pointless unless he was systemically unwell, giving him oral antibiotics is not gonna work. And give him all the oral antibiotics you want, ain't gonna work. You're better off throwing him in the bin because you need to get in contact with that lining there. That's otitis externa. Could even have been some sort of media as well, but that's externa. So, you know, I, I'm just gonna show you just, just a clip by uh, one of our students on, on our Medlin Master program, who's also attended the clinical history and physical examination, just to let you know what, what he had to say. And for those of you who know Michael, uh, you know, it's, just have a listen to what he had to say. The course has been great for a number of reasons. Uh, it's been great to get around uh, uh, in a room with a group of people that are all like-minded. We've all got similar ambitions, uh, really positive outlook for community pharmacy. Um, it's been great to be taught by some inspirational people, some inspirational clinicians, um, who you know haven't intimidated, have just been very open and honest with their experience, and we felt very relaxed to ask the silliest of questions. Future pharmacy definitely, I think, we need to shift towards uh, more, uh, more quickly focused, um, building on the level and depth of uh, uh, consultation interactions we have with patients. Um, we can't compete with uh, the likes of uh, Amazon in terms of digitalization of supply of medicines, so we need to position ourselves where we as human beings can have those interactions with people. Uh, so it's, it's all about delivering clinical service. So there, there's, you know, the reason I showed you this particular video and and there's plenty of them was because to demonstrate to you that you don't need to be someone you know you don't you don't need to be uh, a superstar to do this you don't need to be you know you don't need to be Fahim who spends ages and hours of learning you anybody's capable of doing this with the right training the right support and the right network so what I've then, you know, what I've then, what I was then thinking was, was actually trying to read your mind. So a lot of you might be thinking, you know, I'm not a prescriber, so what benefit do I have? 
And this is something really important to understand folks is you don't need to be a prescriber to develop your clinical skills and develop financially. In actual fact, I have developed more income from consultations and referring patients to the right clinician than I do by actually prescribing. I make more money out of telling patients, actually, you need to go to the doctor, you need to go to the shop, produce, you need to get XYZ, or actually, you need to focus on your nutrition, buy these vitamins, let's do a diet plan for you, let's develop you on an exercise regime, okay, you need to, you need to stop smoking, let's, let's, let's utilize these for stop smoking, you don't need to be a prescriber to benefit. If you're a pharmacy owner, if you're a pharmacist, you don't need a prescribing qualification. You can still start generating, you can start doing so much, you can start teaching, there is plenty that you can start doing. You know, another thing is people won't pay. Now this is, ah, oh, I get this asked all the time and I wanna ask you what right do you have to judge whether a person can or can't pay? When I started my Medlin Mastery Program, I was told no one is gonna pay 13,995 for the course. No one's gonna pay 12K for the course. No one's gonna pay 10K for the course. It's not gonna happen. Look at it now. The biggest things that's stopping you from developing your skills or moving forward is you are, is this, people won't pay. You don't need to worry about whether people will or won't pay. Don't judge the lottery ticket holder, get the job done. You just talk. Whether Darshan, Farah, Sajil, Sadiqor, Tazeen, and the other individuals on, on YouTube and LinkedIn Live come on the course or don't come on the course is irrelevant. It's not, that's not point. My point is just to try to inspire you, try to motivate you that you can make a difference and develop your skills. That's it. Whether you decide to pay or not pay, I'll leave that in your hands. Then you might say, you, I don't have the time. This course has been specifically developed so it works around your time. This clinical history and physical examination course has been developed so it works around your time. Because I know that some of you are gonna be working, some of you are finishing late. So how do we develop a course that works around you? That's why obviously with the COVID situation, we don't even need to be doing face-to-face. -face, and that's why I've developed a plan that takes you from A to Z without you having to be meet face-to-face -face, and we can do it in your time. So now that I've explained to you why it's so important for you to develop your history taking skills and physical examination skills, I wanna go through the course that we've developed for pharmacists, especially for pharmacists, taking into account everything that's happening and I'll talk you to it. So what we've developed is a, is a package for pharmacists and it's at a limited time and what I decided was to develop this course so you have access to everything that I've developed within this, this series of webinars that we teach. So you get delivered your clinical history taking, physical examination and introduction to minor illnesses course. It's usually priced at 1500, but it's now at 997, so you get that. You get access to all the SOPs and consent forms for your pharmacy business or if you want to set up your clinic for free. You get mentoring through the length of the course. So the whole course that we teach, you have access to mentoring. We can discuss all, anything that you'd like to discuss. You also get access to real life case studies and pictures because for me, what's important is giving you patience, giving you real life case studies and not just made up case studies. Because you can pick up a book but in patients, things develop totally separately. You'll have access to videos that I've started to shoot, especially for pharmacists that go through what you're gonna be expecting to find and how you relate those findings to your patients when you do a general, general examination. For example, you have a patient and the books will teach you, look at the hands, look for clubbing, look for uh, ocular nodes, look for Janeway lesions, look for cyanosis. Then you're gonna be thinking, okay, how does that relate? How do I make sense of this? Why would a patient presenting with shortness of breath possibly having sin peripheral cyanosis? Why would a patient who might have a heart condition be presenting with clubbing or, you know, or these nodes or you know, these, these Janeway lesions? We provide you with a sheet that gives you ex everything explained from start to finish. 
In addition to the videos, we'll go through each system, cardiovascular, MSK, peripheral, respiratory, anti-neurological exam that you will have access to from start to finish, not only how to do the examinations, but also what you're looking for and how to relate that to your practice and the relevant anatomy and physiology that's important there. You'll have access to crib sheets. So that's normally at 2000 pounds, but again, you get that for free. You'll have access to crib sheets. So literally step-by-step step how you do an examination. So you've got the videos on one end, you've also got the algorithm, the sheets that tell you step-by-step. Step. Again, that's free. You get hold of uh, the physical examination templates. So you have a patient and the templates will tell you, this is what you need to check for, tap, 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 tap. And that is for your documentation, because if you don't document properly, what's stopping a patient coming back in three years time and saying, actually, Sajil, you saw me, I want to put a case against you because I didn't feel you saw that appropriately. Where's your documentation? You'll have no leg to stand on. Also, you get the, the algorithms for sore throat, earache, hematuria, that's blood and urine, and the crib sheet for this, that how do you diagnose and treat a sore throat? What are the differentials? What are you looking to find? How do you differentiate between uh, a tonsillitis, infectious monoclonosis, and so forth? Earache, how do you differentiate between herpes zoster, otitis media, otitis externa? What findings are you looking for specifically? What algorithm do you follow? You get that for free as well for those sheets. You get access to my anatomy and physiology webinars that are also starting, and normally we do them for, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's normally, 10 webinars and we normally for, for the course itself it's normally 100 pound per webinar but we're doing them at half the price uh, for that as well so you know you get them for, for slightly cheaper than paying you know 100 pound per webinar in addition to that you have a video explaining to you from start to finish how you develop your own business or how you incorporate this in your business so normally all this is normally priced at 11,590 pound but we are selling it for the next 24 hours for 1,896 pound and 90 pence. And you get access to all this material for free. So you can sign up, 10 students, that's the price. And that's the course that you're gonna sign up to. And I would like to ask if for the next 10 to 15 minutes, if you have any questions or anything that you'd like to go through because I've now decided to make sure that we finish on time because with this COVID situation, it's, uh, I know you're all busy and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I appreciate that. So does anybody have any questions you can put on the chat? If you have any questions, anything you wanna ask, just put it on the chat and we can discuss it. In terms of signing up, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, for the next 24 hours. So it can be done on the, uh, on the Medland page. You can now go on live and you can sign up and I will give you the next 15 minutes or so if you've got questions. And if you don't have any questions, it's pretty straightforward. I shall, you know, we shall end it there. So let me know if you've got any questions. Right. I'm guessing there's no questions. So I wish you all a great evening. I'll leave the slide up so you can have a look at that, take pictures, go on the website. Start date is the 6th of April and the webinars actually work around your time. So we keep them in the evenings, but at a time that's suitable for you. At a time that's suitable for you. So it's uh, it starts on the 6th of April but we are very much, because it's delivered by a webinar, it's very flexible to the times that you, you're available. And, you know, we, we go through the whole thing. Perfect, no questions. Well, folks have a good evening. Look after yourself, stay safe. And inshallah, I will see you all next week. And, uh, you know, again, thank you for everything that you're doing as pharmacists. May God bless you all and have a safe, safe evening.